And our next speaker is uh, David Mason. He's a PhD student uh, in, well, Ben Hayden's lab, who gave the first talk in the session, and also with Jan Zimmerman at the University of Minnesota. And um, David will talk about the functional hierarchy for choice in medial prefrontal cortex. So if you try to share your screen, please, David. Okay. Okay, great. Go ahead. There we go. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to hopefully do this fairly quickly because um, this paper actually is uh, on BioArchive. So if there's questions, hopefully we can either get to them at the end or, or get them resolved by, by checking that paper out. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about a functional hierarchy for choice in the medial prefrontal cortex. And um, hopefully, so this is a little bit of a change of gear uh, due to a schedule change from the previous talks in terms of topic, but hopefully it's still interesting for everyone who's here. Um, so uh, hopefully if I've done my, if I've done my job correctly, then by the end of this, I will have at least started to convince you that, um, value based representations or value encoding, uh, within the medial wall of the prefrontal cortex is, uh, distributed functionally, uh, rather than modular and is organized hierarchically. Um, so, uh, first things first, just to thank all the members past and present of the lab, uh, our funding, and of course our, uh, uh, wonderful uh, participants, our subjects, uh, who are fantastic. Um, okay, so so I think the first order of business is to kind of establish some key terms uh, that are necessary for, for understanding uh, what we're trying to get across here. Um, and the first is to say that uh, what we're going to be dealing with is the sort of uh, functional computations that are involved in uh, value-based decision-making. Um, one of them being to encode uh, magnitude. So here we're kind of showing, you know, if you, if you want it, if, which one do you want more? Assuming that the neighborhoods are identical and the commuting time is identical and you like bigger houses. I mean, maybe there's a subjective thing here, but you know, objectively we'll say the, the, the magnitude of value of the house on the left is greater than the magnitude of the value of the house on the right. And um, so that kind of suggests that you're you're able to compute a sort of representation. You're able to encode some sort of uh, some sort of value uh, magnitude. Um, uh, but if we were to then say, okay, which one do you want more? Given the chance that you only have a one percent chance of actually getting the thing on the left versus getting the thing on the right as a ninety percent chance, then now you're starting to integrate the information of probability of success as well. And so these are the types of computations that we're going to be talking about. Um, and sort of these, these um, uh, economic choice computations, uh, what I'm hoping to show is that in the medial prefrontal cortex, they're distributed across a number of areas and that the difference between those areas is uh, quantitative rather than qualitative. But they're still organized, um, and this is kind of a representation of what I'm talking about, this uh, modular organization of function versus distributed, um, but they're still kind of organized in this uh, functional hierarchy. Now this paper doesn't exactly talk about functional hierarchy, but these are the areas we're kind of referring to here, um, namely the prefrontal, uh, medial, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, excuse me, the um, SGACC subgenual uh, anterior cingulate, the pregenual anterior cingulate, and the dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, so next, uh, here we go here. Oh, oh, there we go. Uh, so this is the task that we used. Um, it goes back a number of years. Um, so this is our standard uh, risk-based gambling task. Um, the order of operations here from left to right is that the, the monkeys are presented with some combination of probability and magnitude represented by the size and the color of the bar. Uh, then there's a delay period after which they're presented with another offer. Okay, so this allows us to kind of segment the, the trial into epochs. Um, after another delay period of fixation is reacquired, both of the same offers are then presented simultaneously and the monkey saccades to a choice that he prefers over, over the other. And so the question is what's going on uh, in each of these four different uh, areas that I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of representing the computations involved in, uh, in kind of representing these offers and coding the value of these offers and eventually making a choice. Uh, so these are the areas that we uh, recorded from, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the um, subgenual anterior cingulate, pregenual anterior cingulate, and the dorsal anterior cingulate. 
Uh, and here we have the behavior across all the monkeys across all the sessions, just kind of suggesting that the probability of choosing the first offer is very low when the value of the second offer is dramatically larger than the first, whereas over here, when the, when the value of the first offer is significantly larger, they're obviously more likely to choose that offer. So it's kind of showing us that their behavior is pretty, uh, pretty normal, pretty expected, uh, and, and sane. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of defining these um, computations that are involved in, um, in representing and encoding value, uh, what I'm going to try to show you is that there's an expected shape to, to the way that they're encoding. So if we, if we imagine that what we did is we um, regressed the mean firing rate on um, the expected value of offer one during, uh, during epoch one, and we did the same thing for EV2 during two, um, then what you can expect is that as, assuming that, assuming that one is uh, encoded in the same format as the other, you would expect that there's a sort of positive correlation between the two. Um, but if they're uh, encoded in uh, opposite formats, then as the, in, as the encoding magnitude of expected value one increases, then you would expect the uh, encoding of expected value two to, to decrease, and we call that um, uh, mutual inhibition. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm going to show um, in these next graphs here. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of becomes clear from, from what I'm talking about. Uh, so in this first row uh, is all the different areas, okay? And uh, we have the encoding of, here we're, we're talking about integration. So we have the uh, firing rate regressed against um, the probability of offer one and the magnitude of offer one. And they're positively correlated, suggesting that the format in which each of them is encoded uh, is integrated into a single expected value code. Now, this is our first uh, indication that these functions are uh, distributed rather than modular because you can see that same positive correlation across all four areas. Whereas if it were modular, perhaps you would expect it to only be here and not anywhere else, um, where that isn't, uh, where that doesn't appear to be what's happening. Um, in the next row, we have a similar sort of representation, but here instead we're calling this attentional alignment, okay? Because in this case, we're looking at the expected value of offer two during epoch two during its own epoch and the expected value of offer one during its own epoch. And again, we see that the computation is the same across uh, all structures. And I kind of alluded to the mutual inhibition of two offers. And here again, you find that there's a negative correlation in, in, in all four structures. So the fact that it's the same format for encoding um, for, uh, for all four different structures begins to tell us that this function is not modular, but in fact, distributed across this network. And so the next question is, is there a functional hierarchy? Um, I won't spend too much time on this, in fact, because I'm running out of time. I'll just skip over it. We can come back to it if there are questions. But in order to get at functional hierarchy, what we decided to do was run a linear SVM um, to basically decode different types of information depending on the, uh, the time period um, that, we're, that we're collecting the mean firing rates from. And so the moral of the story here, again, is to show us that function is distributed because in all cases, we're above the shuffle value uh, across all four structures. Um, the other really important thing is that with, the, with few exceptions here, for example, and here, um, by and large, the extent to which information can be decoded from the firing rates during a given epoch, epoch uh, information about that type of, of, of value uh, tends to increase as you go down uh, as you go up this functional hierarchy. And that seems to be the case uh, across the board. And so I guess our, uh, our sort of takeaway message from all of this is, is again to say that these sorts of economic choice computations are uh, distributed across the network in a way that the distinctions between the, fu the functional contributions are um, quantitative rather than qualitative uh, um, where there are, you know, sort of meaningful qualitative distinctions between strict anatomical boundaries. Um, and that this, this sort of functional organization appears to happen uh, hierarchically moving from the VMPFC through the SGACC 
to the ultimately to the DACC, at least for this medial uh, prefrontal network. Um, and so I did that kind of quickly, but I'm hoping that that was a good thing and that this leaves a lot of time. I know we were kind of back against the wall here. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. And if there was anything that was super unclear that I can't answer, then uh, hopefully you can reference the bioarchive paper. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so if anyone wants to pose a question, uh, just uh, pose it in the uh, Q&A window. Um, maybe uh, I'll start with one. So you showed this hierarchy from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex up to DACC, where you basically accumulate more information. Um, and does this information, where does it come from? So is, are there other inputs to this network where you can gain the information somehow? Or? Yeah, I think that's going to be a really important follow-up question. Um, we don't have we don't have the neural data to 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 show that uh, at the moment, but I would imagine that there's um, kind of a long chain leading from uh, sensory input uh, through all the different sensory and association processing areas until it eventually gets here. Um, but we only we kind of we we kind of approach this question of okay, so once all of that sensory information has been integrated and is kind of formulated into uh, into something that might represent the, the value of an offer. Once it gets to this medial prefrontal network, what then does the network do with it? But I suspect you're probably right. That information must be coming from somewhere. And I, I, I imagine that, again, in those cases, you find a sort of gradual transformation of information rather than stark, clear, modular boundaries between anatomical areas. And we have another question from the audience. So uh, again, Lawrence Hunt asks, um, with the decoder, are you decoding left versus right action choice or choose option one versus choose option two? And if the former might have a hierarchy that increases towards action in the MPFC to the ACC, but it also moves away from uh, one versus two comparison. Yeah, so actually, <laughs> We have, uh, we have both pieces of information here. So we have the offer side during epoch one, that's left versus right. Um, here we have choice as in choice one, uh, option one or option two, but that's during the choice epoch. And again, we have choice side during the choice epoch. So we have in all, uh, we have three, three cases in which um, that trend kind of stays the same regardless of whether it's position or offer, offer number. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so we don't have any further questions. And